we don't want to run out of time because I, uh, for demos and discussions, we usually take some time. So I'll stop here and then uh, Eric, <laughs> our SME in security uh, will take over. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, just a reminder, this is a CNCF event. We follow the code of conduct for CNCF and it is recorded. So if you don't want it repeated, don't say it on the recording. Yep. Uh, let me get my screen share going and we will get right into this. Go. This, this. Okay. <clears throat> so we are in chapter five of the Certified Kubernetes Security Specialist Study Guide. And this chapter is pretty good. It's pretty uh, dense, actually. There's a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of pages, but uh, those pages contain a lot of things. We're going to start with the um, uh, OS level security domain stuff, get into um, pod security admission. Um, we're going to touch on OPA Gatekeeper when we get there, but we're not going to get into detail because there's not really there's not a lot of questions on the actual exam around that, um, but we will touch on admission controllers like that. Then we'll talk about secrets, sandboxing runtime, um, uh, container runtimes, and um, a little bit here on um, mutual TLS, which we'll get into. So yeah. without further ado, uh, the first thing we're going to get into is um, OS security domains. And this is, you know, I've done a lot of talks when I was in DevRel with Sneak about developers coming to containerization and some of the things that they uh, that's new to them it's uh, can be difficult and a lot of it is the operating system level stuff because if you've been if you're not if you haven't been doing containers in kubernetes there's a lot of things that um uh people did for you you know op operating system uh, permissions user ids all that kind of stuff that's now right in um a developer's purview and so the CKS gets into this to make sure that um, you understand that and that you understand how to admin a cluster to keep your developers safe, if you're a developer, to keep yourself safe. Um, so the first thing they talk about is root user container access. And they get into the, the, um, the idea of even though you're in a container, if you have UID zero, you have elevated privileges in that container and potentially on the host, if somebody were to accidentally say, bind mount a uh, host file system in there, you're going to be UID zero there. Um, now, they don't go into it in the book. There is some work uh, that's been getting more mature lately about using user namespaces on host level, which allows you to kind of facade that away, but, or sandbox it, I guess you say, but it's not it's not widely used. I've never seen it in a production cluster used, so um, I, I get why it's not in the book, and I don't think it's going to be in the exam. Um, in fact, I don't think, any managed Kubernetes is using user namespaces yet, at least not that I've seen. Um, but I'll leave that for a exercise to go look at. Uh, it's kind of an interesting topic. Uh, we talk about it in SIG security every once in a while. Um, but but uh, they talk about security context. So security context is the API on your pods and your um, containers that allows you to enforce things. And one of those things is user IDs running, whether or not something can run as root or not. And the example we get into here is enforcing non-root user. So they show a, I'll pull it up over here because it's probably more legible. This is the, which one are we looking at? This is the container non-root user error. So this YAML spec is showing, we're gonna start up Nginx. Nginx by default and most open source uh, Docker, you know, official images by default start as root. Any container, if you don't tell it otherwise, will start it, try to start as root. So what we're saying is deploy Nginx and run as non-root set to true. Now that container, that uh, config spec is good because it will try to enforce that. But if we try to apply this, I have a kind cluster that's bare. I haven't done anything to it yet. Uh, we're going to apply container. <clears throat> Come on, non-root user error. And you'll see that it, let me hide my doc so I can have more screen real estate here. You'll see that it says it deployed, but if we get the pod, you can see that we have a, con a create container config error. It's up a little higher. So if we, and they go into, I'm, I'm skipping ahead here. They go into the describe on this. So if you describe, the pod named non-root error. 
you'll see that container has non-root and image will run as root. So the kubelet, when it goes to start that container, it takes a look at the image. If you haven't asked for a specific user, if you have set, don't allow it to run as root, the kubelet's gonna respect that. And it's gonna say, hey, is this UID zero or not? Or can I tell? And if it is UID zero, or if it has no way of knowing, it will just stop and say, hey, I'm not gonna start this because you told me not to run, run as root. Um, key note there is that uh, if you have an Im if you're writing your Docker files for your images, by the way, if you use a user to try to get away from run as root, use the UID because if you just use user Eric or Node or Tomcat or whatever, uh, the kubelet still won't know if that's root or not because it doesn't have a running container to look at the UID. So if you're going to use the user line, you should use the UID number. That being said, um, so then what we want to do is we want to make make this. Can you, can you clarify that point yeah. on the number versus the name? Yeah. So if you're if you're writing a Docker file and in the doc one of the one of the lines you can put in a Docker file is user. Can and from that user, point yeah. forward, every layer forward, the user that that is in context or is being used at that point is whatever you declared. So if you set, let's say you're doing a node image base image, it's going to be root, but they have a um, I think it's a I don't remember what non non root or nobody or some, some yep. node user or something like that in there. If you said user node, if that's what it is, and everything after that, when you do your Docker builds and Docker runs, that's going to work just fine. But as soon as you tell Kubernetes to start that pod with this setting, the kubelet, when it pulls that image and looks at it, it's going to say, ah, the user at runtime, because I'm not specifying anything in my manifest, the user is node. I don't know what UID that is because I don't have a running operating system at that point or a running container at that point to inspect the, the mapping of the name to the UID. So it will stop and it will actually give you an error that says, I can't start that. I don't remember if it's exactly the same error they, or another error. the UID of the host where the, like the, if you do slash etcd users, those are the IDs that we're talking about, right? Right. Yep. So in the container file system, that may be there, but the kubelet's not going to go through that. That that's, that's what I was trying to clarify. A lot of people think it's like the slash uh, users inside the container, and they they spend the one hour, two hour figuring out like, oh, it's the host <laughs> which I don't own, which is well, by the cloud provider or AMI. Yep. Even that, it's just if if it if the user specified in the metadata of the container is not a, a number, if it's not a U UID, the kubelet will just not allow it to start with this setting. Really? If you, use it, if you use UID 1000 or 65,000 yeah. or whatever, it it's like, okay, cool. I know that's not UID zero. So uh, th they will pass this chest at that point. But did you put a string and I have a user in my Linux host? I think it should work, no? Nope. It's, we can, it's... if we have time at the end, we can do a demo. Yeah. But yeah if, if you do, uh, let's say you have node installed locally and you have node in your Docker file. Is my experience that yeah, if you start a, try to start a container up like that, it's gonna okay. it's gonna Good complain. One. This is this is what makes the book club interesting, right? Sometimes <laughs> we saw, we don't know and we we find out together. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that until <laughs> one of my first demos I did as a dev role on um uh container security on 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 this stuff, and somebody pointed it out. They said, Hey, you need to use the number there, not the name, because of that problem. Yeah. Um just a, a quick one. So if you're doing a lot of open shift, um, I think it's 10,000. It's a, you see a lot of images with the 10,000 with 10,000, 10,001, right? Everywhere. That's the explanation. If you like ask yourself, why this number? <laughs> um, yep. It's because it actually it. exists in yep. the uh, Red Hat or Core OS. So uh, Ubuntu yep. may not have it, right? Or Debian may not have it. Um, and the other thing that you said about uh, non root, I think we'll touch in a minute. Nginx, if you do kubectl run nginx in a in a cluster and you see someone doing that and it runs, uh, it's a demo cluster. Like in production, that thing should never run. Uh, but if it you shouldn't. want to run nginx, um, <laughs> well, if you have a lockdown, right? In production, yeah. usually you have a lockdown. Uh, but in, pro in production, you can use nginx, like nothing wrong with nginx, just use an image that doesn't use root. Yep. Uh, I was going to ask you, does the chain guard nginx image, does it use root or Vietnam is the image to go still go to. Ch no, no chain guard image uses root. The nginx one. Correct. They, they, they don't. We have a we have other users that we use. 
we, we okay. set up a different user. Chain, yeah, chain guard images are a whole other thing. I'm not going to get into, but okay. they, they, they are not. They are like distro lists, and they are they they start non root as well. Non root, you you said okay. Mm -hmm. So what they're this the book goes into. You mentioned Bitnami. That's what they're recommending is to try out. Yeah, I saw Bitnami, Bitnami there, and that's why I said like, well, mm -hmm. I'm I'm using chain guard lately, so um, I was yep, wondering that if the engine if I put chain guard there it will work. Yep. Um, yes, and I guess if we have time later, we can talk more about it. But the the Bitnami is a company that VMware bought a while ago. They specialized in making hardened images, yep. and um, in they what they, one of the things they are very good about doing is making sure that they are setting up a different user to run as. So if we take a look at this version where we've got the oh, sorry this version where we've got the Bitnami uh, engine X. So if we apply that. Just type it. Okay, apply container non root user success and get pods. Container creating, and now it's running. And if we exec into it, um, it non root success and just check ID, you can see that the UID is 1001. The GID is still zero, but that doesn't, that's not the problem. But they have set the UID to 1001, uh, which is a non-privileged user. And, and if you see me in any of my demos, if you see my coup huddle recording from last year, you'll know that if you are, if you have a root container and somebody has an application, say that has a, re, a, a remote code execution exploit, and I can get in and start a shell, I'm a shell as root. Yep. And now I can do things like app get or yum or NPM or uh, nmap or all sorts of things like uh, an elevated user inside a container shouldn't wouldn't or a non elevated user wouldn't be able to do so you'll be doing kind of it you'll be doing it on the host you could be but even if you you're could, not right? even if you're just in the container I can set up a beachhead in that container even if even if let's say there are no bind mounts there's nothing allowing me to to escape the container if I'm elevated in that container I can do things in it that maybe I can get elevated on another container I can see or something nice. else. Yep. yep. But um, the next thing they talk about kind of goes to that. I think, uh, oh, this, I'm sorry. They, they go into, you can, uh, so one one way is to set your Docker file user, that sets it in the image, but that's just more like advice, really. Yep. Um, if you really want to nail down who it's running as, like this Nginx Bitnami, it says, UID 1001, and it is if you don't specify, but you can override that with a security context for the run as group um, and run as user. And this one is the container user ID. I think uh, I might not, uh, yeah, there it is. So you can see here we're using just a busy box, which is a just simple um, image that has a root user, but it's saying, hey, start it up as user 1000 and apply F on this. Container user ID. See, there it goes. We can do the exact exa same exec. Um, what do we call it? User ID. You can see that also UID 1000, GID 3000, because that's what we asked for. Now, of course, those need to exist in the container you're starting it as, because your command won't run if, if you. If it won't, I don't even think it'll start. The GID. The UID. Oh, but the GID can be a different number, right? It can be. I'm. I'm. I. You know, that's a good question. Now, I've never tried to start a container or a pod with a group number that doesn't exist. Yeah, the reason. The reason for that. Uh, some users do it because of the mounting EFS, like um, and that NFS mm. over there mm -hmm. has access. Like uh, with Makes a sense. big scientific company, public company, I have done it, and uh, that's yep. the reason for this. And for folks that don't know between the two, the user and the group, uh, those two numbers they play certain role when you're accessing files and then the user is like accessing files but also like the process so but they the the root group is only for file system even when you're mounting things uh from an external file system or or something like efs uh that's why it's important yep okay so moving right along so now we get the privilege so you you were mentioning on the host things on the host so privileged mode um, I, I always joke about this when I give talks. Uh, I, Jerome Petrozoni was one of the original Docker uh, employees, and he wrote dash privilege. He was one of the people, one of the engineers that wrote it, and they actually wanted to call it dash dash insecure. 
because yeah i remember that story yeah yeah it's because it, it, it that's exactly what it is it basically gives you access to host devices you're like it's like your root on the host you would yeah. never deploy anything like this except for some very very specific things like monitoring tools yeah. uh if you're Pri privilege at least for me uh you know uh means something i've i'm honored i'm being honored maybe i give him more memory or more cpu or <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 more, more resources. Like the kingdom. A priority, my pop priority, right? Uh, when you are like doing eviction, like have has a higher number. Like <laughs> I'm privileged uh, to yep. run on that node and not kick it out, kick it out. And for sake of times, I'm just gonna go. Show, you, you will look at the examples here in the book. So yeah. they're, they're showing a, a um, non privileged, bleh, non privileged. If you started a container and you tried to get at. Um, something that should only be, be seen by a root type user or something that's, you know, like kernel host name, um, uh, set, setting the host name to something new, that's restricted. You can't do that in the container because it's not, you're not given those rights. But if you started it up as privileged, you sure could. And it's, again, because you're given access like the keys, keys to the kingdom on the host. Um, a lot of people, um, a lot of hack demos you'll see. They will try to get a privileged container running in a cluster, and then once you have that, you can bind mount. You can mount the host file systems and get in there and do all sorts of nasty stuff. You basically own the node on that, so you, you um, never want to have a privileged. Container. So the the thing, uh, let me think about it. I believe that when you run, you you know you're familiar with kubectl debug command. Mm -hmm. Usually, people use it for kubectl debug, like a, a pot name. You can skip. I do it all the time because of the admins. I you can do kubectl uh, debug node slash and the node name and then pass bc box. Basically, that's what it's doing. It's creating a pod on the fly that is privileged mm -hmm. with the slash host mounted. And then you can do ch root slash host. So that's that's the way I do SSH. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's yep. that's using privilege. But I I've have uh, customers which have their um, Clusters properly secure, um, and then we cannot do it because either they don't allow uh, images from an ECR like BC Box or whatever that you need to have a sec uh, or SH, or and also they put the I, I we're going to talk in a minute uh, uh, the uh, PSP or PSA, yep. right? Yep. Uh, one thing that didn't really get covered here. Um... Sorry, I'm just looking, making sure it's mentioned when we get to PSA, but privilege is one thing and the default is not to be privileged, right? So you start a container and yep. you don't say anything about it. Privileged is false. You have to explicitly say privilege true in order for that to happen. The, the, there's another security, security context that does default to true and that is privilege escalation, um, allow privilege escalation. And that is where a, a binary that has the SUID bit can, el can temporarily elevate your privileges. So think um that's the allow privilege escalation yeah. uh, field. Okay. Yeah. And so sudo is the is the is the, the king of those, right? So yep. sudo allows you to elevate to root for the term of that, you know, session that you're or that command or whatever you're doing. Um and if you don't set that to false, if somebody is able to get sudo into a machine and use it, they can elevate to, to privilege. If you set it to false, they can't. It won't. It will not let SUID happen. Um, so you cannot start as privilege, but you can. You can um, elevate inside. Elevate yourself and then do the C, the 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 C, CTL command. Yep. The kernel. Yep. 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 And that's brought up. We'll see that when we get to the PSA stuff here. So um, let's see. So they're getting into. They talk about kind of some of the things we were just saying. You know what can happen if you. Um, don't follow these uh, practices if they have privilege, they can get at your host. Um, so pod security admission. So this is kind of, kind of the replacement for the old pod security policies if you've been using Kubernetes for a while, um, which were a controller that would um, um, give you errors or give you, uh, um, it, it, would, it would allow you to enforce, sorry, enforce security context related things, but it was it was kind of, it wasn't great. And it had been deprecated forever, and it finally got removed in 125. Um, yes, that's why a lot of people are having trouble upgrading. <laughs> yeah, and it was one of those things. Is like you know, they gave like a year and a half notice. Uh, I think Cat wrote the blog way back when 121 came out, 
And it's like, hey, it's coming. It's really coming. We're really removing this. And SIG security and everyone were, you know, trying to popularize it. And it finally did get removed to 125. Um, and so this PSA uh, replacement is a much easier, easier to kind of understand once you use it. Um, admission controller that allows you to set one of three different levels of uh, blanket security on a given namespace. Um, so go forward, you can see the, there's, um, I'll do the second table first. So you've got um, privileged, which is fully, this is wide open. You're not really doing anything. Um, baseline, which adds a few restrictions to what you can start up. And then restricted, which is heavily restricted, which is mostly usually what you're going to use in a production cluster. Um, you can then, for any of those, you can say for this namespace, either enforce it, which means just, you know, like it says, violations will be rejected or enforced. Audit it, which says don't block anything, but let us know if anyone's doing anything. So this would be like what you might do ahead of time if you've never used it before and you want to make sure that you're not going to break things. And then warn doesn't, it's it's kind of like audit, except that it, uh, it spits it out to the command line. So it's for more for sandbox environments, I guess, or developers. So an example of this, here you see that we're creating a namespace and we're applying the label pod security Kubernetes IO enforce restricted. I've got move this over here, uh, PSA namespace. So there, let's go ahead and I'm gonna apply this and this will create the namespace with that label on it. Come on, there we go. So we, get, uh, so we can see our PSA namespace is, uh, is there. And then we're going to deploy BusyBox into it, just with no extra, just you know, just BusyBox, no extra uh, security context settings of any kind. Okay, apply. And this is just what do I call this? PSA violating pod. PSA violating pod. Immediately it is blocked, and I know it's a, it's a jumble of words here, but if you if you look at it, you're th seeing things like. Um, to do, to do, uh, pod, pod security restricted latest, um, allow privilege escalation. That's the one I was just it's talking It's like about. screaming at you. Error, yeah. error, false, false. Yeah. You broke this, and you broke this, and you broke this. And the audit log, if you have an audit, that's what you're going to like record in the mm -hmm. audit log. Uh, you can yep. see your like uh, login system. Yep. And this is the one I was just talking about, allow privilege escalation. If you did not set this to false, it's saying, no, we're not gonna let you deploy because we don't wanna worry about somebody getting root inside because you got sudo or, or something like that. And one of the demos I've done before is where I get access to a pod that gives me access to a, a security con, I'm sorry, a, a token that allows me to deploy my own container, my own pod, that image that I'm pulling in has sudo in it. And this would block me. It would be bad that I'm in there, but at least I wouldn't be able to become root in my own pod that I'm starting from my own container. Um, all, and all, all run is not root. All that stuff is in here and it's blocking me from deploying this because of all that. So how do you resolve that as, yeah, as a, if you're like the developer and you're deploying to deploy your dev cluster and you're getting this, well, you need to read what it says and say, hey, I can't do any of these things. So you can see here's my security context. And so what's I'll, the default then for a lot of escalation? Is it true? True. Yeah. Ah. That that's why it's that's, important that you that's why you mentioned the privilege escalation situation where that one is uh explicit. Like and the default will be false, right? Yeah, the, the default is unfortunate. And then this one is the people think uh, yeah. So I, I think I I see the problem there. Also, um do not use uh, scanning to remove the pseudo uh, binary or link because people may just rename it or have it oh, executable. Yeah. That <laughs> I, Eric, I've seen everything. I mean, like, not, I've seen not, everything. Like, oh, I removed the pseudo may, and I'm good. I may or may not have worked somewhere where we had a binary on a lot of systems <laughs> that was not sudo, but it was sudo. Um, uh, yeah. it wasn't, I didn't write it. Um, but anyway, uh, and some of the other interesting things. So here's your run is non root. Um, setting a user and groups explicitly. Uh, set comp profile, saying use the runtime's default set comp profile. That's out of, I'm not going to get into the details, but take a look at that one. That's kind of interesting. And then my favorite here is we're doing a drop capabilities. Um, if you're running business applications, you generally don't need extra Linux system call capabilities, and you can drop them all. 
Um, so I think the um, and if you do, you can pick which ones you need. Which sometimes yeah. is for things like CNI, um, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you need access to the network, but you don't need everything access to the kernel, right? right. So in, enough for what you that controller needs. And it, I said like no business application should be messing around with the host or usually not. Yeah. So if we do this one, PSA non-violating, it's happy. You can see it's it's creating, creating. Oh, that oh, means that um, Kubernetes check the image and the image doesn't have sudo, the sudo file? Is no. that what it means? No. It doesn't do any kind of validation like that. It's just, it, so if this is set to false, um, it sets a, 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 a oh gosh, I'm not a Linux admin, but there is a bit you can set to say, don't inside this kid namespace, I think, uh, do not allow any process to elevate. Yep. And as soon as they try to, it, it knocks them down and says, no, you're not allowed. Yep. So you can still get That's a nice space. That's a nice space in the Linux you know, Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And yep. and it's it's the image can have sudo in it, but you can't you wouldn't be able to execute it. Yeah. This gets passed down to like uh when you kube like calls container D and then run C and then you create me a namespace, right? For this process, actually put this in, right? Do not allow it. But by yep. default, it's allowed. That's the problem. Yep. Okay, so that's PSA in a nutshell. It's, it's, it's So you want to make sure for the test that you understand the three levels the PSA offers and then the three different, you know, the the uh, reject, or I'm sorry, not reject. Um, I, know, I, don't, I don't think the book pointed it out, but um, just for people to awareness, security context field is allowed at the pod level that covers all the containers and also at the container level. So you may have a question about like, block all the pod, all the containers, mm, uh, you do it at the pod level, but then they ask you like block all the containers, a certain, a certain thing in the security context, and you do it in the pod level and it doesn't work and you spend some time and it's because certain fields are not applicable at the pod level. You have to put it at the container level. So try to learn the different, what are the fields that are different from the pod level container level, because that might be something that maybe you struggle or so even for practice in real in real um applications and in a move of complete self um promotion years ago my buddy matt and i wrote a blog on this and there's a cheat sheet in here that has little logos i don't know if you can see it from whether it's um pod or container these are these aren't all of the security these are like the 10 top oh, ones. that's brilliant yep yep so I'll, I'll put a link to this yeah. in the doc and in the in the Thank chat. Thank you. Because yeah. you can lose time in the exam, right? Trying to put it in the pot level and the pot level, and then what you need to do is just put that security context field in each in the in one container and the second container. Boom, you're done. You didn't waste time like figuring out why it didn't work. And, um, now you can't use that way. blog on on the top. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just it, it's not that many. It's like um a, a few, and then when you read them, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but. I would just make sure that if you're getting a question about PSA, why it's not working, make sure that these levels and, and modes are, that you understand which one's being used. So if, yeah, if you cannot bring yourself on that in the, sure in the that wall. Luke, that, um, the yeah, Luke, Luke is saying to print print that in and put it in your wall while you're doing <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah. I was having, no, no, thinking um, about having to you. I don't, know, we, to you. <laughs> I don't know if we have it, but we can add it to the a link. Uh, you know, you can use the reference the Kubernetes reference and you do for the bot spec and then in there you click and then you can see yeah. like the security context. No, I'm your... definitely getting this as, as tattooed on my arm now. <laughs> so um, 20 minutes. So um, we were talking, if you if you saw in the in the, the Slack chat, uh, the author was talking about us, you know, the, the uh, OPA gatekeeper is probably not going to be on the test. Yeah. You should understand what it is because all the things you can do in PSA are, are great, but there are some things you could do in PSP that you can't do here because it is a very rigid setup. Gatekeeper and Kyverno, sorry, OPA and Kyverno, and I think there's another one that's been um, getting popular, but those are the two like, big hitters of admission controllers for policy as code. And Gatekeeper uh, allows you to write your rules for OPA, which is kind of a bigger thing than just Kubernetes. Um, but it, you write your rules in, in a language called Rego, and implement it and allows you to enforce blocking on very you know, whatever you want. There's a lot of standardized rules. There's a library of them you can use. Kyverno is exactly the kind of the kind of same kind of thing, 
except everything they do is all CRD based. So if you're more familiar with Kubernetes YAML, and if you're only interested in Kubernetes policy, it might be a good one to look at. Um, if you're already using OPA Rego or Rego for other tools, like there's a lot of policy scanning tools that use o uh, Rego for their language for that. It's it's kind of the the policy as code darling. Um, you might take a look at you know that might swing you one way or the other. Uh, my former company, their IAC scanner uh, uses Rego and an OPA embedded engine for the, for doing its scanning. Um, the, yeah, me uh, being selfish, um, I did a talk last year on like the spectrum of all these validation things, mm -hmm. and I talk about the new one that is in Kubernetes in beta, uh, mm -hmm. which is using cell validation. Mm. Um, I don't know where the recording is, but at least the slides are are there. Um, cool. um, so I'm I'm gonna skip through the OPA Rego stuff. Just be aware what it is. If there's a question on the exam, I can't. I don't think they're gonna. You're gonna have one. You're not gonna be required to write Rego. They're not gonna want you to learn a language for this. Um, the only thing I can think of, and I'm thinking back two years when I did my CKS um, that has expired. Uh, I think I remember Absolutely. having to make sure the admission controller was uh, had to install it, gatekeeper. But I could be remembering a different admission controller. I'm not sure. Um, so that's not hard. I mean, it's just a it's just a apply manifest. So, um, so I'm not going to do the demo for that just for sake of time because we've yep. got 15 ish minutes left. The secrets um, definitely is is in the exam. Yeah, secrets. Yeah, uh, if yeah, if you, if you're weak on secrets, study your secrets. Um, go back to your CKA that you took or your CKD and understand secrets. Um, the Main thing about secrets, the first thing that they, they mentioned here is make sure, this is especially true for if, if you're a, a CK, a, an admin, right? Is if you're rolling your own cluster, if you're, if you're using a, just a, a, a managed cluster like EKS or GKE or whatever, nine times out of 10, your etcd uh, secrets storage is going to be encrypted because it's the default. If you're rolling your own with kubeadm or some tool like that, that may not be the case. In fact, it's not if you're just doing a kubeadm deployment. Your your etcd control plane or actually etcd server is not going to be set up to automatically encrypt secrets. So the base64 encoding that you see as you interact with them, that's what they're stored as in etcd. And the point here is being is if hacker can get into your etcd and get access to the secrets, he can just base or she can just uh, base64 decode them, and they're they're effectively free text. So the demonstration here was to show that, that in action. So let's get here, let me change here. And uh, we're going to create a secret called generic app config from this literal. And I think I have copying and pasting from an ebook is a pain because it puts the attribution in there. I think I have, yeah, right here. So in order to do this, you got to have etcd. CTL and they're talking to, and here they're saying do this on the cluster. Oh, actually, they're creating the secret first. So I should. I, should uh, do that. I was going to say great. Uh, yeah, that's so a secret. Oh, I was got a little bit confused because it said app config. Sorry, <laughs> it was I'm, I'm skipping ahead like I always do. Create secrets. Generic app config, uh, and this is from literal. Password equal pass WD one two three. That's my password. How do you know? Uh, okay. <laughs> you use Adobe, don't you? Uh, no, it's one of the things when Adobe had their big breach, password password one three was like yeah. number one. Yeah. Okay, so so we've created the secret. Um, now we're going to go in and we need to get in. We're gonna I'm gonna exec into. So if you if you're using kind like I am here for your exploration. Um, the control plane is just a container, so I'm going to exec into it. If you're not, if you're on killer SSH or, or, what, or whatever, get into your control plane wherever it might be or get access to it. Uh, in the test, you generally are SSHing into it. So I'm going to do an exec IT on my kind control, control plane order. and just run bash. So I'm, I'm SSHed into my control plane now, effectively. And the first thing I need to do is I need to have etcd client installed. I need to have hex dump installed, which is what this BSD admins does. And later I'm going to need Vim. So I'm going to do both of these commands inside 
my control plane image or container, I should say. So I have them both now. Now, and you, you, this should be familiar. If you've done your CKA, you've done etcd control commands before. But what we're doing, I'm going to run it, and we'll talk about it. So we said, hey, etcd API version 3, um, using the CA cert on the control plane node, um, and, it's, and it's server cert, so it thinks it's the control plane, the API cert, whatever. Um, look for... Etsy Kubernetes PKI etcd server. Oh, and there's these, right? Yeah. Look for registry secrets default app config and then pipe it to hex dump so we can see the, the, the actual guts of it. And so you can see there's password, password one, two, three. So it, it's, it's right there, clearly visible. There are other ways to get at it. This is a nice quick way to, to see it. Um, so what we want to do is we want to have these things being encrypted and decrypted as they come in and out of etcd. And the way they're going to do this is, I thought this was kind of interesting. They go pretty low level on this and create a secret from you random or, or you get your entropy from you random, base64, create that. And then we're going to um, create an encryption configuration. And I have that. What did I name it? What did they name it? Oh, wait, actually, this goes into that file you have to create it. Yeah, I think I, I have it so I can copy it in here. Hold on, sorry. Uh, dump it, CD secrets, not there. It's in there, it is. I'm just going to copy this. And I'm just going to use this. This I created this one earlier. It's, it's any secret, any, um, yeah, secret is fine. So I'm going, well, it's fine for this call. <laughs> I'm going to CD into Etsy Kubernetes. And I need to make a dir called ink. And we're going to create an ink YAML. Paste it in there. Then we're going to come over to our manifests. And we're going to refer to that. So the first thing I always do, so there's several of these things. If you did this on the CKA, you probably remember doing these. You edit the manifests, the the, the uh, static pods. I always make a copy of it first because <laughs> you screw it up. Yep. You are in bad, you're having a bad time. So I just put a copy over there into temp. at the API server. Yeah, habits, habits, you get burned once, right? <laughs> yes. Hopefully it's not on an actual test. Okay, so um, the things that we're adding here are into the command, we're going to add a lot. I'm just going to put it at the top. We're doing an in. Yeah, if you don't remember the, the, the string of this flag, you can look it up in the, in the docs, the yes. GA encrypting. Or you can run the API server dash dash H, and then you get all the flags uh, in there. Another trick. Like I usually point people to the docs, but you don't, if I don't have the docs, like that's a quick way. So we're adding an argument to say, hey, go to this. Go look here for the the uh, config for this encrypt for encrypting, and then we need to add that to the volume mounts and volume. I could have sworn I copied this, so I'd have to deal with. Uh... Uh, namespace constrained deploy gatekeeper. It didn't, did I? Privilege PSD. Damn. All right. So I'm going to add a volume mount. Actually, we'll do it like their demonstration has. So they started with name, doesn't really matter. Um, ENC, ENC, and we're going to use mount path Etsy. Kubernetes CNC read only is true. And we go down to the volume, add the volume, name C, post path. Let's see, Kubernetes ENC. Type directory 
Yes, I know. I could just copy and paste under Lumi, but I didn't. Yep. And if uh, you have trouble, just use just the things that are already there. Yeah. Um, in the file to speed up. That's true. The exam. Okay, so we're gonna write quit. Or run or or type every letter like Eric did. And yes. Yolo. And I've done it. <laughs> so now, if we try to get pods. We should get nothing for a minute while it restarts the API server. How do you select multiple lines in Vim? Is it Shift V or Shift A? Uh, well, I always just do five yank yank. Yeah, that's wait. that's me. Yeah, this is <laughs> I me. Know there's a visual I'm, way to do it. You were in this in my in the same class. I uh, Vim one one finger Vim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's only three lines. I can do it six times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And this is the part where you start to sweat. It's like, oh, yeah, shoot, there yeah. we go. Hey, it's coming yeah. back up. And the reason is for people that don't know is like, if you make a typo in that file, then the pod, the container will not come up. Uh, yeah. Will come error. This is the uh, API server, so it, it is the front end. An error. It okay. takes a minute. Okay. It, it it it's. Why did it, it error? Um, kindnet throws an error. I think because the API server was down. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the logs on it, but. You're only going to see that one on Kine. Yeah, yeah. You might see it on another one in Kine, elsewhere. Yeah. So that did it. And now we can, if we exec back in. It's because of the readiness uh, uh, health check. Ah, yeah, uh, it took a while. Sense. OK. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Who was that? Thank you so much. It's safe. It's safe indeed. Right. It's safe. Thank you. So it's still unencrypted. Probably you're laughing at all the comments that we're doing, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went in here quick to show you it's still unencrypted because ah, we weren't doing yep. this before right so it's it, but if you create a new one it'll be encrypted but if you do what they're saying here so we're going to do k okay, git secrets all well eric the the point out to, to point out is like if you create a secret from this point on all those secrets will be encrypted and then when you request them through the api server since they're stored with the bit saying this was encrypted then they get decrypted for you but the ones that already were there all of them are encrypted so you have That's to right. do this process of um changing them so what and i did I, yeah the question for you is any does it take anything down to do the re-encryption Yep, you took a thousand secrets and you just rewrite wrote them. Uh, it's not going to restart pods, no. But, yeah, no. but if a new pod starts up that uses a secret, it should be fine because the decryption happens before it gets to them. Yep. Um, so I'm going to rerun the dump, uh, hex dump now. And now that now it's encrypted because we ran that loop through all the secrets and re-encrypt them. Um, so. Uh, oh, but here's another question. Uh, it's just asking open questions. So the pods that are using secrets, that they're using the secrets, mounting the secrets in those worker nodes, the secrets are still in those machines are unencrypted because the kubelet pulled them down and they're un unencrypted. I think they're always unencrypted. They're that's always the unencrypted. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's a security yeah. like domain question of like, just by securing the secrets in SCD is it means like if somebody steals that file of the SCD, they cannot encrypt it. But if they get into the kubelets and you're mounting, right, or you're requesting, those aren't encrypted. Yep. And then that's why some people use technologies like um, the CSI uh, mounting on the fly, right? That never yep. touches disk. It's, the, it's in memory. And then um, things like inject on the side, like vaults and, and, and the runtime, right? The, the container request for that secret or any container or a site container. Yep. Okay, we've got four minutes. <laughs> we knew this was going to be a tough one to get through. So I'm going to rip through this uh, GVisor talk or discussion points. I think that's really the last quick. one, like the hashtag exercises. Yeah. So what um, else is next? Let me check. The, the runtime sandbox is basically saying, hey, you know what? We all know when a container starts on a Linux system. It's it's an abstraction using namespaces, C groups, and whatever. And um, if you are able to break out of one of those things, you have access to the kernel that is underneath all the containers running on that box and all the processes running on that box. 
So additional security can be gained, especially in, uh, this is popular in multi-tenant environments, uh, cloud providers, things like that, where you either wrap, the, two, two of the common ways we're gonna discuss here are wrapping your container with a tiny VM, and there's several ways to do this. They're gonna talk, they're, they're talking about um, uh, Kata containers in this one. Um, yeah. And then the other way, Google had a really interesting way to do it, we called Gvisor, which instead of wrapping it with a VM, it starts a whole nother kernel in the container. So you're not actually, when you're making system calls to the, to the kernel, it's not to the, the underlying host kernel, it's to the one that's in the Gvisor uh, runtime, which is or in, your, in your container. It's kind of an interesting, lighter weight way to do it. Uh, nice little diagram about that. And honestly, I got three minutes. I, I, it's going to be hard to demo this, so we're just going to run through the show the examples in the book. Yep, and, that's good um, enough. Yeah, so you can see, you, in order to install this, there's a, a, some packages you would need, and interestingly enough, you can do this inside the Docker container that is the kind control plane. It actually works in there because it's not really a VM. It doesn't need nested virtualization or anything crazy. No, no. it's it just running a binary that is a micro work. micro kernel micro VM. Yeah. Thing. Um. So it's showing how to install the run SC, um, which is the, the the package that has this Gvisor stuff in it, um, configure it, um, and then you set up uh, reset container D, so the container need knows about it. Then you create a Kubernetes uh, runtime class for Gvisor, saying the handler is that run SC. Okay, so this kind of is the 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 resource that says, hey, this is how that maps the word Gvisor or the name. To that that and this, handler, and this could be in the same like you the portion of the top study the portion of the top like yeah. how to edit the the plugin to add the plugin mm -hmm. and then and then these pieces that Eric is talking about. Yep. Once you have the runtime class in place, then a pod can use it, and you can see the runtime class names is in this pod spec, and they're specifying Gvisor. So whatever that name is, will then need to have a corresponding runtime class, kind of like storage classes and DBs and stuff. So you're saying, hey, start this container up using the Gvisor runtime class. And um, yeah, so they start that and then they're gonna exec into the Nginx pod they started and look at D message and you're seeing that there's log info in there saying, hey, yeah, I can see Gvisor started and all this specific stuff that you would only see if Gvisor was working there. Okay, one, one minute to talk about mutual TLS, uh, which is an interesting topic to bring up in this chapter, I thought. Yeah, right. But um, mutual TLS is basically just saying, uh, you, you understand what TLS is, right? So browser makes a call to a website, transport layer security says, oh, I have verified the certificate coming back. I trust that that's, you know, sneak.io or chainguard.dev or bankofamerica.com or whatever, because the cert certif certificate is signed and my browser has a root CA that it can validate that signature. Mutual TLS is similar, but for pod-to-pod -pod communications going both ways. So encrypted traffic wire so that your hackers can't see what's there. And then mutual TLS also allows the pods between and the nodes between them, whatever layer you're, you're putting this into, to validate X is who it said it was, and it's coming from Y, is, which is who it said it was. It's a way to validate that that's true. They talk about... Um, uh, service meshes, you're not going to be required to install a service mesh. No. If you have questions about Istio, Marino is on the call. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Istio and Linkerd are the two very popular service meshes, which are, uh, apply that can apply this kind of thing at the layer, several, the layer 7 layer, I think. Yeah. And give this to you in a very robust way. But you can also do it at a lower level in your CNI. So Calico, Cilium, lots of the, lots of the CNI providers will allow you to run a um, wire guard or other uh, TLS between the nodes and between the pods. Um, and it'll, it, it, it's facaded from you as a developer if you do it that way, but it is cool to have because a hacker on a server over here isn't gonna be able to snoop the traffic very easily yeah. um, because of that. And, also. and we are at time, so uh, we're at the summary now. Um, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I remember from when I took the test two years ago, the Gvisor stuff is important. I'm yep. sorry we had to skim through it so fast, but make sure you practice, practice. that. I don't remember doing a Kata container. No, nope. no Kata. But you should know what it is. Yep. Um, and secrets. Those yep. two things are probably the biggest two. 
Beyond I'm guessing the, PSA. PSA. P Honestly, security context, once you grok it, it's actually, it's like, oh, of course. Yeah. Don't want and, it secu and security context. Yeah. yeah. So people. Because once you install a PSA in restricted mode, it forces you to go learn all those things you should say. So. Yeah, I think that those are the, the three things to, to remember from this chapter. And and as always, like take they pra practice either your kind, practicing killer coda. Um, you have killer dot sh and those teams. Oh well, yeah, we're out of time. I don't want to keep anyone. Uh, so thank you so much for, for joining this session. Thank you, Eric. As always, uh pleasure to hear you. That was amazing, us. Eric. What a dense chapter you had to go through. Yeah. And you did so well. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And tell your friends that uh, learning Kubernetes are about to take the exam. Actually, my my expired last month, so I'm going to take it. Yeah, I'm going to be taking mine. Hopefully, so if you're at KCD Texas, I should be there. Ask me if I got my case, my 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 my, my um exam done. When is and when is KCD Texas? After that is April twelfth, thirteen, somewhere. It's one of those, the Friday of those two. April. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's my goal. Q one. I won't, be, I won't be able to come to Paris for KubeCon, unfortunately. Are, are, are you doing a talk, Eric? No, I'm an organizer. So I'll be oh, there. Okay, cool. I'll be running around. Um, I'll Chad. Cool. Cool. Right. Thank you so much, Peace, everyone. everyone. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Yep. Bye. See you all. Bye.